enormously pleased to have you here joining us this evening with really one of California and University of San Francisco's great treasures. Before we get started, I really want to thank the people who helped make this lecture series possible, starting with the Dean of the School of Management, Mike Weber, who from the very beginning when, we, when I proposed this idea has been enormously supportive and none of us would have this opportunity if it wasn't for Dean Weber. So I want to publicly thank you and express our deep appreciation. <laughs> the lecture series has been supported by the Jesuit Foundation Board with the rector of the Jesuits who chairs it, John Copeland, whose faculty in our School of Management has been enormously supportive. And one of the Jesuit Foundation Board members is here, our Associate Dean, Catherine Horiuchi. Uh, I don't mind having a board stacked in our favor of the School of Management, and I even like it better than when they have the wisdom to fund something of such magnitude. And so we're very grateful to John Copeland and Catherine Horiuchi and uh, the Jesuit Foundation Board for their grant in support of this lecture. Uh, this evening, we're also very honored to have from the Jesuit community a noted historian uh, and noted faculty member, Father Tom Lucas, join us here this evening. And it's only appropriate when we have such a, a, a wonderful citizen of the state of California and citizen of San Francisco that we have the former police chief of San Francisco who will keep us safe uh, uh, and has for many years and faculty member of the School of Management, Tony Rivera here as well. So um, we're very, very fortunate. The chair of our Department of Public uh, Administration and Nonprofit Administration, Michael O'Neill is here to join us. And before introducing Kevin, let me introduce the most important member of the Starr family, Sheila Starr, who is here to join us <laughs> and who was a student at Lone Mountain Campus. So, if any of, so unless someone falls asleep during the lecture, which will not occur, Sheila is the only one in this room who has slept in this building. Okay, so she was a student, she had classes, we're very glad that she's here. And we're honored deeply tonight. Uh, I could go on for the length of the lecture to talk about the great work that Dr. Kevin Starr has done, um, really in, th in major streams as a historian, as a distinguished faculty member, and also as a distinguished public servant, as former uh, librarian for the city of San Francisco, as state librarian under three different governors. It's hard enough to get an appointment under one governor, never mind under three different governors to have an appointment to serve. And so Governor Wilson, Governor Davis, Governor Schwarzenegger all had the wisdom. And now Kevin is State Librarian Emeritus, award winner nationally, acclaimed for his California Dream Series. Uh, I would be doing a disservice to go on and on. The only final piece I can say is as great as a writer, researcher, teacher, scholar, treasurer he is, he's an equally great human being. And it's really an honor to have such a distinguished graduate of the University of San Francisco be able to join us this evening for the Change the World from Here lecture series. Welcome, Dr. Starr. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, what a pleasure. Thank you, what a pleasure. And thank you for coming out this evening to listen uh, to me for a second or two. I'll be as brief as possible. On the other hand, I also want to emphasize that when I wrote this uh, speech, uh, everything about my undergraduate experience at USF came forward, uh, swept across 50 years, 50 plus years, et cetera. So, and uh, the, I think the under, for uh, those of us who are in college teaching, the undergraduate perspective is extremely important because we always remind ourselves, uh, teaching undergraduates, that you never know what they will be, what they will become as they unfold. And secondly, in terms of, of information and interpretation, uh, undergraduates remind us what Samuel Johnson said, that it's in the intellectual discourse, it's not necessary always to be original, but it is necessary to be correct. So I, I'll, I'll try for, for each of these things. Now, uh, the, uh, the change the world from here is assigned to me by Rich, who is my former colleague at USC. We're still mourning his departure, but at the same time, I know you're celebrating his, arri his arrival here. Uh, assigned to me, so I, I just sort of let my mind uh, play on this. And I said to myself that ours, ours is an age of, of branding. Or perhaps I should say that branding today is more important than ever. The branding of products, the branding of institutions, the branding of institutional ambitions. In an age of digitally accelerated change, change seems to be uh, 
uh, gaining intensity at almost geometric rate. Take the period between, say, 1952 and 1962, uh, for example, and, and in retrospect, test its rate of change, the rate, rate of change of that decade, for any of you who can remember that decade, a few of us here can, test its rate of change in comparison with the period between, say, 2002 and 2012. A and you can see what I mean. Identities, values, priorities, what's in, what's out, seem these days to exist within a time frame that will, that will soon give an even more full truth to Andy Warhol's notion that we each enjoy 15 minutes, we each will enjoy 15 minutes of fame. From one perspective then, branding is necessary so that we can test what a person, a place, an institution, or a product is in its, latent in its latest manifestation, even as simultaneously it's en route to its next identity, as are, of course, undergraduates. On the other hand, branding can also underscore perennial values surviving amidst digitally accelerated change. Thus, when we think of the University of San Francisco's motto, change the world from here, which is now so successfully uh, spread on these beautiful banners throughout the city, we can see it from two perspectives. On the one hand, this motto catches USF now, today, this moment, this global local moment, so fraught with challenge and change. On the other hand, it underscores a mission that USF has been accomplishing since the founding of St. Ignatius College in 1855, affecting and effecting people, places, society, from a defined institutional base. And from an even further perspective, this motto, change the world from here, can help define the long struggle and search of Ignatius Loyola to find out what he should do with his life, followed by an equally important period of discernment as to where the newly founded Society of Jesus should focus its efforts. Let's start with the oldest perspective and down to the centuries, down the centuries to the present. The biographies of Ignatius Loyola and the histories of the order he founded, the one, for example, the early Jesuits on the early society recently written by Georgetown University professor John O'Malley, SJ, all uh, emphasize the gradual unfolding through experiment, discernment, and choice of Ignatius's own search for work in the world and for the mission of his society. Visit Loyola Castle in the Basque Country, as my wife and I were privileged to do a few years ago, and you sense immediately that Ignatius Loyola came from a highly defined and well-branded uh, family uh, and origins, a noble Basque family with a strong military tradition living in a combination of fortress and resident, residence branded throughout by the same wolves of Loyola that thanks to uh, the entrepreneurial uh, activities of Father Lucas now stand so magnificently in front of the Geski Center of Gleason Library. Coming of age in such an environment, Ignatius knew what he wanted to do, become a soldier. But when that ambition left him confined to bed, his legs shattered by a cannonball, a, a reading of scripture, the lives of the saints, and a mystical treatise by a medieval Carthusian shifted Loyola's ambitions to a desire to do something great and glorious for God. But this conversion, however dramatic, represented only a partial branding of Ignatius' ambitions. Making a retreat at the Benedictine Monastery of Montserrat, he might have remained there for the rest of his life, a pious and devoted Benedictine. But he moved on. His branding now alighted on the priesthood. And nearing 30, he began to study of Latin, sitting alongside 14-year-olds, then going on to the University of Paris to study liberal arts, philosophy and theology. Encountering at the University of Paris like-minded men in search of role, in search of branding, they discussed among themselves the possibility of making a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and perhaps remaining in the Middle East as missionaries. Ordained priests in Venice, they were technically diocesan priests and might very well have gone each in his own direction into the service of the people of Venice uh, through a parish ministry. 
But no, along with a number of other priestly groups in this era, they were envisioning a new kind of religious order, priestly and communal, but freed from monastic and, men, or, and or mendicant obligations. Clerks regular, they called themselves. But what to do? What kind of work in the world would be theirs? Initially, relocating themselves to Rome, they volunteered as hospitalers and hospital chaplains, and for a while it seemed that a hospital ministry would turn out to be their vocation, their brand. They worked among the poorest of the poor in the slums of Rome. They inaugurated a ministry of helping women forced into prostitution by poverty to escape sexual slavery and rebuild their lives. And perhaps this might have energized, uh, emerged as their work, become their permanent brand. Of course, we know what happened. The requirements of the Counter-Reformation swept those still young men up in its surge of well-defined needs. Missionary work and education, missionaries to European lands lost to the Reformation, missionaries to Asia and to the Indies recently opened by Spanish and French exploration and settlement. And so the newly founded Company of Jesus acquired its brand. As missionaries, they reclaimed vast portions of Middle Europe lost to Protestantism. And within 100 years, they had spread Catholic Christianity around the globe. As educators, they became the schoolmasters of Europe. The Society of Jesus had branded itself, and in one way or another, that brand has, with many variations, was, has lasted until this day. It is a global, local brand, an intensification of place, and local institutions within a global perspective. And a global perspective fully appreciative of subsidiarity and localism in society, culture, and the practice of religions. As a historian of California, and let me assure you that despite Richard's wonderful words, it's not, not a, a crowded field, but as a historian of California, I have always been interested in the processes in and through which the regions and communities of California, indeed the entire state, came to branding, to self-awareness, to a perception of the common good. In this interest, I have been greatly influenced by the California-born and educated Harvard philosopher Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, uh, whose archives I had the privilege of, of uh, going through on a rather meticulous basis as a graduate student and Royce's philosophy of loyalty and his concept of higher provincialism. Royce was born in the mining town of Grass Valley in the Sierra Nevada and spent the first 10 years of his life there. He experienced the gold rush as something just past its peak, as symbolized in the abandoned mines and miners cabins he and his friends would explore in their uh, rambles through the region. Um, in fact, at his 60th birthday party at the Hotel Wilton in Philadelphia, he said that no child raised uh, under the shadow of the Acropolis in Athens would have a, a more dramatic sense of the past than he did, wandering the hills of, of Grass Valley and looking at those abandoned shacks and abandoned mines. Later, his mother, Sarah Royce, 1819-1891, born in England, reared in New York State, and making the arduous trek with her husband by prairie schooner across half a continent in 1849 would augment her son's memories with her own recollections. After six months of difficult travel across an untamed wilderness, arriving in California, what Sarah Royce remembered most vividly a half century later was the manner in which various church ladies from the local Protestant parishes had formed a circle of philanthropy to welcome families who had made the trek across the continent, to see to their immediate health needs, which were frequently pressing, and to assist them in their adjustment to their new circumstances. This notion of a caring community in the midst of a gold rush imprinted itself on both mother and son. As a mature philosopher and historian, Josiah Royce chronicled the manner in which an otherwise heedless, reckless, headlong frontier community nevertheless came into consciousness, came to an awareness of the public good in the 1850s, and this amidst a larger panorama of social dislocation, violence, 
and family breakup. The remarkable thing about these early frontier years, Josiah Roy speculated, was not that Americans behaved badly on the frontier. That, after all, could be expected. But that, all things considered, they managed to behave as well as they did, to build churches, synagogues, and schools, to care for the orphans, to give refuge to the homeless. Take frontier San Francisco as an, ex as an example. It was a community created overnight, a rapid, monstrous maturity, as historian Hubert Howe Bancroft would later describe it. And in terms of community service, there was a lot of practical work to do. In those days before the rise of either government-sponsored public services or foundation-based philanthropy, that challenge fell first and foremost upon the religious communities of San Francisco. Take the Jewish community, for example. When a steamer exploded on the Sacramento River, leaving behind one Jewish orphan boy, the Jewish community got busy establishing the Hebrew Benevolent Society, formed in 1849 to take care of this orphan. From this development, the Eureka Benevolent Association, established in 1850, the Ladies Society of Israelites of San Francisco, 1855, the Hebrew Observer Newspaper, 1856, a Jewish magazine, the Weekly Gleaner, found in 1857, followed by another publication, the Hebrew, started in 1862, the Hebrew Ladies Mutual Benefit Association, founded in 1864. All these coming together to form a Jewish philanthropy that was not just local, however, its focus. In 1859, the San Francisco Jewish community sent $3,700 to endangered Jews in Morocco. In 1864, the Jewish community sent a similar sum for support of Jews in Jerusalem. In 1870, the Jewish Orphan Asylum and Home for Aged Israelites opened in San Francisco and a free burial society was organized. A Young Men's Hebrew Association opened in 1877. In each of these instances, a faith-based Jewish community was establishing social, educational, and charitable services to care for its people. When the Presbyterian minister Samuel Hopkins Wiley uh, informed the City Fathers of San Francisco in 1849 that it was time to establish public schools, he was told that there was no need for such schools. Didn't the good reverend realize that a gold rush was on? There are no children in a gold rush, he was told. A short time later, Reverend Wiley organized a parade of children and adolescents down Montgomery Street. The City Fathers got the point and a public school system was established. The Mormons had opened San Francisco's first American school in April 1847 on Portsmouth Plaza. The Reverend Allium Albert Williams, a Presbyterian, operated a school on Portsmouth Plaza from 1848 to 1850. These and other schools were hybrids, religiously supported but receiving public support from city and state. The same was true for orphanages. By 1855, for example, the Protestant Orphan Asylum in San Francisco was receiving $5,000 annually out of a total budget of $12,000 from the state for the care of orphans from all over California. Altogether, the Protestant Orphan Asylum and the Catholic Orphan Asylum were sheltering some 200 children by 1855. By 1854, there were 1,703 students in the Protestant schools of San Francisco and 930 in the Catholic schools. After 1856, a more consistently publicly supported public school system was developed. Higher education was exclusively a religiously sponsored enterprise, with Methodists establishing the University of the Pacific Italian Jesuits sponsoring Santa Clara College and St. Ignatius College in San Francisco, and Congregationalists opening the College of California, acquired by the State of California in 1868 as the nucleus of the state-supported University of California. So too were the other social services of that era generated by religious communities. Methodist minister William Taylor opened a hospice for sick seamen which he later persuaded the city to publicly support as a full-fledged county hospital. In 1853, the Presbyterian ladies of the city formed the 
Ladies Protection and Relief Society, still operative, incidentally, to care for women finding themselves stranded and unsupported upon arriving in San Francisco through the death of their husbands, fathers, or brothers. Arriving in San Francisco in 1853, the Young Men's Christian Association, in addition to its lectures, debates, educational programs, and religious services, was operating a shelter for homeless boys. By the end of the decade, San Francisco also had a refuge, the Magdalene Society, sponsored by the Roman Catholic Church, uh, offering haven to women wishing to escape prostitution. Roman Catholic Sisters of Mercy, meanwhile, established a House of Mercy, which offered food, clothing, and shelter to more than 500 homeless or impoverished San Franciscans in 1856. The Sisters of Mercy also opened a hospital, St. Mary's, flourishing to this day. The Daughters of Charity arrived in San Francisco in 1852, with two of the sisters dying of cholera on the arduous journey across the Isthmus of Panama. They opened an orphanage for girls at Market and Montgomery Streets, where the Palace Hotel now stands, followed by a day school. In 1855, with more Daughters of Charity uh, arriving, the sisters opened their school to boys as well. By 1858, their school was caring for 75 orphans and 300, 300 day students. By the late 1870s, San Francisco had reached such a point of maturity that a homegrown order of nuns, the Holy Family Sisters, was established by Elizabeth Armour, a protege of the Tobin family an order dedicated to the daycare of children and home visitations aimed at ensuring children's health. Thus, when the Royce family moved to San Francisco in 1865, young Josiah was already encountering a city that through its private sector, in this case the religious sector, was aware of the common good. From this private awareness, moreover, had been stimulated the public sector to create schools including the Lincoln Grammar School and the Boys High School, now Lowell today, that young Royce attended, a public university, public hospitals, orphanages, and similar institutions. California, Royce would later write, was making the transition from a frontier society to a province that was aware of itself from the perspective of its culture and the common good. The basis of this transition, Royce believed, was loyalty to the community, a notion which Royce later elaborated with the help of German philosophical idealism to a full-fledged philosophy of loyalty and what Royce called the higher provincialism. In 1908, Josiah Royce, then at the height of his career, published a book, Race Questions, Provincialism, and Other American Problems. The theoretical core of Royce's book was the essay, Provincialism, in which the Harvard philosopher extolled regional life as something profoundly serving the human need for community. Provincial loyalties, Royce argued, fostered community by providing Americans an appropriate human scale, a society in, a, in, a pro, in an appropriate human scale. America needed such personalized connection more than ever, now that Royce argued, now that the United States was becoming an international empire, a national and an international empire. Provincial identity, moreover, enlivened, Royce argued, arts and literature, and loyalty to province upgraded the moral significance of local life. Americans, in point of fact, could best discover what it meant to be an American when Americans discovered their American identity in a localized context. Such an identification, Royce argued, such service to the social order in its local context constituted a higher provincialism with a capital H and a capital P that countered the centralizing and alienating, alienating tendencies of mass society in the United States. When members of the Society of Jesus found themselves in the Pacific Coast frontier in the mid-1850s, this twofold, their twofold brand, global local, missionary educational, the drama of the world and the needs of a specific place showed itself once again in the twofold service embarked upon by the society as missionaries to the Native Americans of the Northwest 
and educators centered in the San Francisco Bay Area, where a new instance of American civilization was in turn seeking its own new brand, its own new identity, its own new sense of regional possibilities. Did the emergent city of San Francisco require doctors, lawyers, businessmen, judges, civil servants, diocesan and religious order priests, elected officials, educators, the Jesuits and lay faculty of St. Ignatius College began to change the world, the immediate world of San Francisco from here, the immediate here of the classroom and the superb St. Ignatius Church and campus uh, that stood next to the college, which by the late 1890s was arguably the busiest and the most successful inner city Jesuit college of its kind in the nation. If one were to judge from the superb classrooms and laboratories, the crowded pews of its church chapel, the graduates occupying crucial positions in every sector of the city to include the mayoralty, the board of supervisors, the civil service, the police and fire departments, the bench and the bar, the roll call of diocesan and religious clergy, the sisterhood, all in the service of the people. Now ask yourself how the world was changed in those years, the San Francisco world I'm, taking, I'm talking about, the local world. Ask how it acquired the vision and mastered the practicalities of urbanism in these years. And you must, of necessity, make reference to St. Ignatius College and its graduates. The earthquake and fire of, of April 1906 destroyed that college utterly, reducing it to a pile of rubble. And for a quarter of a century, the world that had to be changed from here, the San Francisco that had to be rebuilt and restaffed, was helped on at this task by a college soon to call itself a university fighting for its survival during those years in a shirt factory in Hayes Valley before its removal to Ignatian Heights, where since 1913 a grand new church awaited its arrival. Now was it Yogi Berra who said that nostalgia ain't what it used to be? Or was that Leo de Rocher? So one of the others, I, I can't remember. In any event, nostalgia is certainly the temptation of those of us of a certain age I arrived here at USF in the fall of 1958, who attended this university when that highly defined high provincial branding, to draw upon Josiah Royce's concept of the higher provincialism, remained in force. This was the USF of 1906-1956, USF 1906-1960, wherever that transition occurred that had changed the world from here for the past half century and more. This was the USF that enabled generations of first generation college students to acquire a higher education and enter business and the professions fully prepared to maximize their talents and opportunities. This was the USF that had made San Francisco very much something of its own. If one were to judge from the multiple roles being played by its graduates from the reconstructed, in the reconstructed city. And this was the USF that believed that these graduates should be thoroughly anchored in philosophy and theology, as well as the beginnings of expertise in their chosen professions and careers. I can personally testify to the ability of USF in this era to change the world from here, from the perspective of what the world and the here looked like in that era. I arrived at, this, at the University of San Francisco in the fall of 1958 I arrived with no backing, uh, no support, save for, for the uh, support extended to me by the Jesuit fathers. For four years, I was formed by the roll call of formidable, of, uh, formed by a roll call of formidable professors, Jesuit and lay alike. For four years, I enjoyed access to the magnificent Gleason Library, which I still use in my research. For four years, I was guided towards graduate school by, Fred, by Father Edmund J. Smythe, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I arrived at USF a first generation college student, uh, and thanks to the generosity of this Jesuit institution, I left, U I left USF in June of 1962 with a bachelor's degree, a Danforth Fellowship to Harvard, uh, at Harvard incidentally, where I linked up with 12 other USF or St. Ignatius High School graduates who we formed a little association that met at the Yard of Ale and we discussed occasionally, discussed uh, the, uh, the hilltop. Uh, and, and 
and uh, a fiance, incidentally, from the San Francisco College for Women at Lone Mountain. I guess in those days you were issued one when you, when you graduated from USF. My wife, Sheila, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary in a few days, a few weeks. The Kaluvel connection, incidentally, quite common in that era. Certainly USF had changed the world for me as I departed uh, from its here. In those days, the branding of USF was undergoing a change as a result of social change itself, which is to say the growing maturity and ambition of the Catholic population, the Second Vatican Council, moving the forces on, uh, en route to the Second Vatican Council, and the careful tutelage of USF professors and advisors eager to introduce their students into the wider world. And so, uh, in addition to those of us who followed the accustomed USF route to law, medicine, business, teaching, the clergy, civil service, police and fire, a new generation began to look to the graduate schools of California and the East and to careers as professors in the higher education uh, sector. I think looking to schools in the Midwest and the East, which is commonplace for undergraduates today, who USF graduates go off to the London School of Economics, to Oxford, to Cambridge's programs, et cetera. You have to go back 50 years. You got, you got nervous if you got outside the mission district for too long. It'd be kind of, you'd have ang ang high anxieties. With the USF uh, San Francisco people didn't, uh, didn't travel. No one traveled much. And of course, you look in the 19th century where the average American never went more than 50 miles from his or her uh, birthplace, and you can see the sort of that tendency to, uh, survived uh, somewhat I into the 20th century. Today it is common for USF graduates to go on to the best graduate schools in the nation, Europe, and the United Kingdom. But 60 years ago, a new development was on the horizon when USF graduates began to go on to UC Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, and similar places in search of graduate and or professional degrees. I remember my wife and I in the Army in Germany applying to Harvard and to Princeton, successfully in each case, had to look up on the map where they were exactly. So the, first of all, we had to find where Massachusetts and New Jersey were. They were all, it was quite educational. Uh, something w was happening to a Catholic population with its deep tap roots in local place, in this case, San Francisco. As Bob Dylan was singing, yes, indeed, the times they were changing and USF began to rebrand itself through a full uh, co-education, major change, a growing diversification of its student body, the academic pedigrees of its faculty, the acquisition of the Lone Mountain campus, a bold entry into the computer and digital age, a continual program of campus construction and improvements that continues to this day. Today when I walk this campus, I feel the presence of the USF of my undergraduate years like a ghostly, uh, the, the Tongva people of Los Angeles say when they, when they walk the streets of Los Angeles, they can feel the Tongva village of thousands of years ago still, still there underneath the, behind the surface. And I can see that campus, the few and simple buildings, the barracks left over from World War II, the automobiles on the campus turning into a parking lot, the predominantly uh, Irish and Italian commuter population, 1,200 of us in all, entire student body, with the exception of, of the nursing class. Surviving, that, that, that shadow of USF survives in my mind as a fragile shadow behind the current campus development, so splendid in its taste and detail. And yet, still, the world is being changed from here, only now more formally and on a more accessible global scale. The DNA code of USF, education, service, commitment, upward mobility, which is, code, which is a code going back to the Jesuit colleges of the Counter-Reformation and Baroque eras, this DNA code remains discernible to my septuagenarian understanding. The San Francisco perspective of my era remains what is now a San Francisco that virtually contains to use that scholastic term, a global awareness and a global population. I mentioned at the beginning of this talk how the Jesuits fanned out across the globe from approximately 1550 to 1650 and put themselves in dialogue with the peoples and traditions of this planet for purposes of understanding them better 
and for long-term purposes of evangelization. China, India, Japan, the Philippines, North Africa, French Canada, Florida, Cuba, Mexico, Puerto Rico, wherever one goes these days, one can encounter the living institutional and architectural evidence of that global expansion by the Society of Jesus anchored in a distinctive philosophy and practice of enculturation that prompted Jesuit missionaries and educators abroad to listen, listen long and hard, listen with open minds and heart, learn the language of the peoples and cultures of the planet. Thus, the USF of 2013, seeking to change the world from here, certainly constitutes an expansion and acceleration of a global local sensibility uh, that is quite vulnerable, venerable, but not the beginning of this sensibility, which can be traced back to the earliest decades of the society. In times past, to change the world from here, USF invited Irish and Italian lads in and, from, and, and a smaller, but present a number of Hispanic lads in from North Beach and the Mission District. Many of these are still coming. But the university has now invited the world and given the uh, mobility of our planet in terms of transportation and communication, given the sheer ecumenical nature of California itself, indeed com America itself, a, a, a global population has formed. The world has come to USF even as USF has reached out to the world. The world has come to California. The world has come to America. Yet there are challenges in the new realities and the new branding of USF. None of these challenges constitute final barriers, but they should be at least acknowledged. First of all, there is the issue of university identity. Not just this university, but universities in general. There should always be, I believe, an element of contemplative value in even the most engaged university. From the beginning, which is say from the Middle Ages, universities have served an instrumental purpose, initially the preparation of clergy, physicians, and lawyers for the service of church and state, which at that time, of course, church and state operated in tandem with many ecclesiastics holding high civil office. But even in this founding era of serving as a training academy for church and state, the university as an institution coming out of the city, the revival of cities, nurtured a contemplative function involving research, analysis, and speculative contemplation. My, uh, one of my mentors at Harvard, the great uh, urban historian Lewis Mumford, would talk very wonderfully about this, about the city as a full, as a medieval city, as a, re a resurgent plano mundi, representing the fullness of the world of the university which was established, which was coming out of this of these revived cities, representing also the fullness fullness of knowledge, uh, uh, and uh, the fullness of of, of contemplative am ambition. The great intellectuals of a previous era, previous early Middle Age era, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux comes immediately to mind, were tend to be in the main centered in the monastery. Even if, like Saint Anselm, they left the monastery to become Archbishop of Canterbury. The great intellectuals of the high Middle Ages, by contrast, Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas, Dun Scotus, William of Ockham, Roger Bacon come to mind, were university men. As early as, as early apost an early apostle to society, Jesus was the Roman College, today known as the Gregorian University, and here the great Saint Robert Bellarmine, a doctor of the church, comes to mind as well. Paris, Salamanca, Bologna, Oxford, and Cambridge, where at Cambridge, where Erasmus served as professor for about 13 years, kept this tradition alive into the Renaissance. The rise of the research university in the Enlightenment added an element of scientific research to this contemplative identity, now increasingly linked to empirical research. At the same time, however, in the mid 19th century, John Henry Newman reasserted an important component of this, con of, uh, and that was this contemplative identity, namely an important component of university life, namely knowledge as an end in itself. And in the decades that followed, among Catholic universities at least, Newman's corrective of a purely instrumental identity for a university 
acted as a counterbalance to the legitimate need for universities to do work in the world as well as to foster research and scholarship. Newman's emphasis upon knowledge as an end in itself, I believe, exercised great influence on undergraduate education in Catholic colleges and universities. Not only did such institutions in America especially prepare undergraduates for work in the world and for, and for professional and postgraduate studies, they also, th uh, through this institution, uh, offered philosophy, theology, humanities, and social sciences, assisted and enriched disciplines which assisted and enriched undergraduates in their journey to identity, to personal identity. There is a tension here, true, but not a contradiction. And this duality, this tension, is crucial to university identity, to include the identity of the University of San Francisco. From this perspective, USF can be, indeed it already is, an agency for social justice and change, precisely because it is anchored in a cumulative tradition of value, a philosophy of heredis handed down across the centuries. That range of values has become of late more and more ecumenical, as in the case, say, my wife and I were privileged to be uh, here that evening when it was dedicated, as in the case, say, of USF's recently established Chair of Tibetan Studies. But it remains intensified by a Jesuit philosophy of education that has become increasingly global in its emphasis. The ambition to change the world from here then must be viewed and exercised simultaneously as an instrumentality, a mode of action in the world, as well as a source of wisdom and insight of great formative value to the individual student. We become better, that is, by doing better in a fusion of corrective action and reflective thought. So too does enlightened self-interest, which is to say the upward mobility connected to higher education, so too does enlightened self-interest need to be seen from this perspective. Not only do we become better educated when we seek to do the right thing, to understand why we should be doing the right thing, and to reflect upon what we have learned from others in the course of corrective action, we also receive the gift in this process of becoming more useful to others and hence to ourselves. And amidst this rising level of usefulness, we discover that the world has a place for us as stewards of that which should be preserved and agents of change for those things crying out for reformation. Useful to others because we have become men and women for others. Useful to ourselves because in becoming men and women for others, we expand our sphere of usefulness and action. Rather than remain a narrow, self-centered focus, that is, we experience an expanded sense of usefulness in this world. And that sense of being useful to the world is crucial to today's economic situation. In Spain, for example, uh, more than 27%, uh, the statistics seem to vary, but more than at least 27% of young people uh, are being told, in effect, that they are not needed in the world, in the, in the world of work, in the world of corrective action, the world of anything, really. The statistics are less draconian here in the United States, but they are high enough to be scary. In my age group, the small, silent generation coming of age at the high point of an expanding economy, at the takeoff point following World War II, the greatest arc of prosperity in American history, we blindly stumbled into a sense of being useful strictly because we were so scarce and the economy was expanding so rapidly. Today's USF student, by contrast, can very well experience a paradox by becoming useful to others, by becoming more useful to the world. We become more useful to ourselves and out of the sheer connectedness that comes from engaged and committed service, we become more useful to others. The upward mobility of an earlier USF has survived, but it has become something deeper, richer, more global, more nuanced, more communitarian, more communitarian and ecumenical, but just as effective as it always has been in preparing young men and women to meet the challenges of adulthood, to find a place in the world for themselves, to pursue happiness as well as to as, as the Hebrew has it, 
took them all into happiness that comes from repair, struggling to repair the world. USF can lay claim to changing the world from here because the world has become its community. 40 plus years ago, with the encouragement and guidance of the late Dr. Ralph Lane, professor of sociology, USF students began to perform useful work in the Western Edition, then an economically embattled neighborhood as part of their sociology program. Nearly a half century later, that Western Edition for USF can still be found in San Francisco, but it is being found in other places as well, in Central and Latin America most conspicuously, due to a developing sense of world community that is part of the USF ethos. At the same time as we seek to change the world, however, we must keep in mind the from here, the hereness, the localism, the cherished and privileged simplicity of place, city, university, the time together that has been given to us as a mitzvah, a gift. We all know the medieval student song, Gaudiamus Igitur, a song about rejoicing in our student days, which passed so quickly, our precious time we have together here on the hilltop, soon to be memories and patterns in a larger life experience. For those who went before us, that USF time belongs to history. For me, that USF was 50 years ago. For undergraduates today that you, and students today, in general, that USF is now. For others still young or yet unborn, that USF awaits them. They too will be seeking to change the world from here. They too will be studying disciplines that you recognize as well as studying disciplines only now coming into focus. They, like you, will use their time here as being crucial to the process of developing into serviceable and successful agents of change and development here and elsewhere, in the world, in human hearts, including their own. Thank you so much. Remember Gertrude Stein on her deathbed said, uh, what's the answer? And nobody, <laughs> nobody said anything. <laughs> then she said, what's the question? <laughs> so we welcome questions. If you have narrative, you can send a letter. But if you have a question, we'd be welcome to for our advantage and uh, to uh, throw out in some of the insights that uh, Dr. Clay is going to say this morning. Any points? Yes, yes, please. October 57. I remember my senior year in physics class when it was announced. Well, 57 is uh, closer to uh, 62 than 52, isn't it? Or no, it's about midway. But you're absolutely right. No, none, of these, none of these divisions um, can hold up completely. You have transformative events. For instance, uh, in terms of uh, ROTC, you have an anti-ROTC movement surfacing at UC Berkeley, 57, 58, 59, uh, well before 64, well before the Viet American involvement in the Vietnam War. And you have, piece, you have bits, of, bits of history that put on, uh, put on uh, suspense, uh, put on uh, suspense for a while. For instance, the civil rights movement was put on, spenster, on suspense during World War II. And yet without World War II, it would have uh, not have gestated with the intensity that it did after another period of gestation in the 1950s. So it, it's very, uh, dates, can, uh, dates can be really a, um, a distraction, but some, in some way we have to quantify time. So I'll give you any kind of trans, uh, for instance, um, uh, any, any kind of tr uh, transformative events, uh, the fall of Dien Van Phu in the 1950s, all sorts of things you can talk about that are really uh, watershed, but the cumulative effect of those things come together and create a much different ethos. And take a look at clothing, for instance. Look what undergraduates are wearing in 1963. They're still wearing narrow ties, lapels. Uh, uh, young women still have poodle cuts, etc. 
And then take a look at 1965, even just a year, two years later. Uh, or movements that, that movements that, ha that come out of uh, very mysterious origins, like the whole hippie movement, which I don't think is, I'm doing, I hope to be doing a book next with Oxford on, uh, on um, California from s uh, 64 to 79. You know, I use the word dream in all the, uh, all the titles, America's a California Dream, et cetera. I've got the title for the book, if not the interpretation, Smoking the Dream, California in the, in the, <laughs> in the 60s and 70s. But there's so, many, so, much, con so much sort of outrageous uh, 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 effusion of, of iconography, behavior, statements, et cetera. It's very hard to sort of get a grip of, and yet there it all is. It, it, it changed things for a long time to come. Incidentally, when I talked about the, the 50s earlier, I'm still a 50s guy. I'm, I'm, I'm basically a tourist in this kind of modern society. <laughs> and I try to learn from it, and I survive in it. And when I look out at my undergraduates, I teach at USC, when I look out at my undergraduates, uh, whom I'm 50, 52 years older than, um, I try and find common po points of agreement. It's much easier these days to find common points of agreement than maybe it was two, 20 years ago, and certainly was in the 1960s with, with people who had been born and who were 50 years apart at that time. So decades are basically kind of a C minus way of dividing, but what other ways do we have? Do we hear at USF? Well, I hate to use the E word, but it's, it's going to become increasingly elite. It already has. Um, the expectations of, of the expectations of, of the global culture, the expectations of the expense of, of private education, the expectations for career development of even first generation college students, etc. All that will will make uh, USF much, um, uh, a much more elite. Uh, it's, it's, I can already see it happening over the 50 years that, I, that of my association. Now by elite, I don't mean snobbish or, or not ch trying to change the world from here. And I think that's why uh, the university, especially the Jesuit community, is fostering this idea of changing the world from here to sort of counteract that it not just be a, a finishing school for, for uh, wealthy international uh, uh, students or local students interested in the globe. So it's a, there'll be a tension. There'll be a tension between, uh, you can see, um, I remember following the graduate, I was on the McCarthy Center for a board since it was founded. So I served about 10, maybe 10 years on that. And, I, and I seeing where the graduate students at USF, were, 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 where they were going after they took their degree here, the programs that would be, have been announced with the, with the ringing of the bells from the Campanile of St. Ignatius in 1961, 58, 59, which were today the expectation for, for, for the world. So th th that's good. I think from my point of view, I, 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 like to found, I like to follow the founding fathers that there's nothing wrong with enlightened self-interest as long as it's enlightened. I think so it would be a, ver a, ver a more elite school, more international, um, more expensive, in the meantime, they'll be holding actions against each of these tendencies. Would you just reflect for a minute on the, the future of the profession of history and historiography? I mean, where, for instance, uh, the, the current young Kevin stars, whether at USF or Notre Dame or Santa Clara, so forth, where do you see them going to get advanced training? In oh, our young, our young, the, the young historians out there are magnificent. I'm, 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 I'm but a primitive potaster compared, to, compared to their uh, analytical uh, subtlety and expertise, etc. The people coming out of the great graduate schools, being formed in in the pr history profession, are, are 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 very sophisticated. Look at. Um, Look at the go, go look at the best seller list and uh, or not the best seller list. Look at the books that get reviewed today. Extraordinary, ambitious titles, and people like, uh, for instance, Simon Shama, who's a man of a certain age, have brought back kind of the traditional 
concept of history as literature. History is, uh, as a, uh, the historian is a man or woman of letters. So you'll have that. There's, a, there's an, uh, an upwardly, the, the, um, the, the creation of an extraordinary audience of people means that people are reading history again. Um, and um, th there'll be some ideological, on the larger thing, there'll be ideological battles fought. They're, they're still there. History, had a, history in the 1970s and 80s had a lot to say about suppression, injustice, and, and, that, and, th and the things that had to be said needed to be done as an expression of a ge the boomer generation that had brought these things up in the 60s and 70s. When they became historians, they didn't change and not be interested in these things. So history has to also then, and uh, again, I repeat, uh, Sh uh, Shama or, or, or Ni uh, Ni Neil Ferguson, historians have to also find out what, what to affirm. Uh, history as, build as providing building blocks of identity without being mere booster, et cetera. So I, I, I didn't work formally in history at Harvard. I did history, I did American studies. American, it's called History of American Civilization based out of the English department. So I was always interested in the drama of the imagination. So I think I've kind of landed either way behind in history or way ahead, it depends. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I, I can't make up my mind on that. But I think um, uh, I, I think uh, uh, public uh, public television. Look at look at look at uh, uh, Downton Abbey. The popularity there. I mean, you can't help but want to be interested in Edwardian culture in uh, the 1930s and the extraordinary intelligent reading uh, writing uh, uh, for a broad audience by David McCulloch, et cetera. I think history is doing very well, and the great companies that are publishing history now: Knopf, Random House. Simon and Schuster. I mean, it's mainstream publishing. Departments and Catholic universities in the United States. Well, I would say uh, Notre Dame, very, very important. I'd say Georgetown, very important uh, history department. I'd say St. Louis University, a very important history department. The St. Louis University uh, carved out a relationship to the borderlands and to the Middle Ages. History, philosophy, Middle Ages. Um, Notre Dame has done American uh, history in a, in, a, in a broad and generous way. There's a whole generation of young men and women there are doing wonderful things. But, uh, but, uh, let, let me. I don't ever ask that myself that question. Certainly, there are many, many distinguished Catholic historians at various places, but they tend not to be necessarily be at Catholic schools. It can be all over the place. Are you? Um, USF graduate from the mid 1950s, Francis Healy, very, became a very distinguished professor of history at, at Harvard. Went from USF to Harvard. That was part of that relationship that I sort of suggested that began to grow in the 1960s. It depends. Um, say, for instance, in terms, it depends on mentoring here. Who, how much time senior faculty, when they find people that might be heading towards an academic life, the time they put in for them and counsel them about going on to school and help them prepare, et cetera. In my era, it was done magnificently. Father Smythe, Father Stackpool, they, uh, Father Martin, who was the academic vice president, these were very generous men in their time. And they got us all in. They got us into Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. Yes? So we'll start on back and then we'll work our way. Please. Um, you mentioned, uh, thank you for your, your uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, the, uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the decades of the 50s and 60s and then the period between 2002 and 2012. And as a, as a historian, uh, as an historian, excuse me, you could, uh, you could see uh, culture a as fad and, uh, and events imprinted upon the norms of human behavior and how people uh, actually relate to their, to their culture. Um, are we seeing a fundamental change today in the decade from 2002 on with how the new generation looks at the culture through digital media, through social media? Is this going to fundamentally change how we do business, not just in institutions, but as human beings relating to our history? Well, that's a great question. It's a great, it's really, a, it's really kind of almost a call for, for, uh, for a kind of history to be written. Well, 
let's look at popular entertainment because as the filters are less. Look how much, look how interested we're now, for instance, in the Mad Men series. And aside from other things, we're interested in the sort of rise of the consumer culture or the Downton Abbey, uh, et cetera. I think um, in my age group, the, the Catholics, I'm only talking about Catholics now, but in general, we're interested in Thomas More and the Tudor period, et cetera, because there was a, a sense of bearing witness in, an, in a larger culture, bearing witness to Catholic values. Uh, so I, I think that, um, that we have to make up our minds. Is this, a, is this a particularly golden age we're in now? I suggest that to my students. I suggest, you know, you may think that this time uh, when, you're, when you're my age is, my gosh, did we really have all that? Was that really in the air? But I don't know that for sure because the unemployment, the economics, et cetera. Um, let me go back to the 50s, lest I seem to be glorifying it. If I were African American, I wouldn't be too happy with the 50s. If I were uh, w women seeking, seeking equal pay for equal work, I wouldn't be too happy, uh, et cetera. I'm not um, uh, naive in, that, in, in those regards. If you, um, whole portions of America were invisible during that time. So I'm kind of avoiding your question because I can't answer it. It's too, it's <laughs> you're, I, I don't think, you know, it, it's, I don't think history reveals itself that quickly as to now. I mean, I'll ask you, what do you think? Do you think we're in a golden age here? Uh, or do you think we're in a terrible time? Or do you think we're in a combination thereof? Those who are blessed to live in California, I think this is a fabulous time. Um, uh, I think uh, with oppressive resources diminishing, uh, with the uh, changes, the disruptions that are happening in, in the economy and in the political, that will occur in the political sector, because of diminishing resources, I think the next 50 years <coughs> will be very challenging. That's right. If you're, if, you're, if you're a child suffering from malaria in South Sudan or water shortage in Darfur, you're not, uh, this is not see, the best of times. That is a, a very powerful point you make, a very powerful point. <laughs> but wait, one more point, one more point. Isn't it interesting when you say change the world from here, isn't it interesting how young American men and women from the most privileged uh, backgrounds will take on these internships and go to places like uh, that are suffering terribly and to work there and to be there un and to travel there unafraid and to do it? I th I, to me, that is absolutely astonishing. First of all, if I were their parent, I'd be hysterical about it, but the, obviously the parents have, have agreed to, to let it go. So. It's, it's, it's just a, a side of, of, of things. What will this generation be like when, when it's in charge, when it is in charge in uh, 25 to 30, well not even, yeah, 25 years from now, what will it be like? Will it be anchored in a sense of American purpose, sense of, of, of the culture changing the world from here? Will it be anchored? Um, a lot of my age group just disappeared into the suburbs, never heard from. But then again, they were happy <laughs> in, their, in their disappearance. But, uh, but we weren't prepared. We weren't told that we had to go out and change the world. We were told that we had to seek, up, uh, seek upward mobility. And uh, for instance, in my own development as a historian, I have tried, as time has gone on, to develop more and more what Unamuno calls the tragic sense of life and to see uh, the war of good and evil as occurring simultaneously. I, in the, my early first history I was accused by some of being a booster only because I was f focusing on the California as the solution to people's problems between 1850 and, six and 1910. And I didn't write a great big chapter on the decimation of the, of the Native American in Humboldt County. On the other hand, a generation of historians 10 years younger than I, like Patricia Limerick, Richard White at Stanford, great, two great historians, they start writing that story 10 years later, and I learned from them. Professor, I with you in the faculty lounge many years ago, and uh, when you were teaching here, I just wonder what your memories are of your time here with David Arnett, and uh, I remember when you were at your supervisor, and you had a meeting at Don Lance's house at uh, home meeting. Uh, well, thank you. I, I, I came in one out of the money running supervisor. I, there were six openings. I was seventh. But if you're seventh, you might as well be 17th. It doesn't matter. You're one out of the money. So um, uh, I, um, I enjoyed running. For, I tell you what, when, when I later worked for elected officials in Sacramento for 10 years, 
and administered things for them, like a half a billion dollar construction fund, which I, as state librarian, the largest single library construction fund in the history of this nation, I had tremendous respect for our elected officials, Republican and Democrat alike, because I had to come up against that system that they had to go through at least once myself. I didn't have that kind of de talk fail and democracy in America says Americans tend to be superior to their elected officials. I like to think of politicians as, you know, look, what's the approval rate of Congress these days, like 11% or something? But I had a different point of view. I saw men and women from the community, different backgrounds, strengths, weaknesses, because I had run myself. Uh, so um, I think it's a good experience. Uh, it's a good experience. I don't think I would have continued on to write history if I had won. You can't, you can't sort of show up in the morning and have the taxpayer pay for your uh, your work. Although as state librarian for ten years, I did write three books. Uh, that's because I had a little room next to the state library and got up at five o'clock and and worked till nine, then walked over there, then came back at five, and then turned on Captain. Uh, Kate Milligan is in Star Trek at 10 o'clock. That was my big treat. But you can only live that way for, you only live that way for some time. But I, I, I enjoyed, I'm very proud of the 15 years or so I put into public life as an appointed official. I'm not, I'm not electable anyway. I, I talk too fast and <laughs> my limitations are self-evident. I was here, um, 81, uh, 89, eight years. Uh, I w what do I remember about it? Well, I mean, do you, do, you, do you want the true answer or do you want the nice answer? <laughs> I, I, the, a lot of that union conflict got on my nerves. I'm not anti-union. I'm an old-fashioned Harry Truman Democrat. Uh, um, but a lot, there was a lot of conflict at the, at the, during that point. On the other hand, there was a lot of wonderful things going on, the acquisition of Lone Mountain, et cetera. I think the institution today has much more institutional ambition. I didn't. S I don't. I don't remember as much ambition as uh, then as there. And this was 30 years ago as there is now. Now I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm just saying you ask what the differences are. Um, I think um, today there's a in more intense view at USF's, and and again I. When I, when I walk into that library, I'm doing a book now for Knopf on settlement. I don't want to talk about it too much because I bore people with dinner on it. When I walk in and I see the books, uh, the texts accumulated by Father Peter Dunn in the 1930s and by Monsignor Ellis in the 1950s and 60s and, and by Father um, Robert Ignatius Burns and, 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 and look at this, the selection of Gleason, I see really a, a kind of great vision that was in the, in the library itself from the 1930s onward. That vision has externalized itself, I think, rather dramatically. Michael, you've been here for a number of years. Uh, don't you think, I, I think I'm, I, we arrived at more or less the same time, didn't we? What? So you came in five years, uh, of course you were off in the education school, et cetera, which is always much more ambitious, more connected. Well, I, but the, the, uh, the uni this university ne has negotiated itself through some extraordinarily troubled and transitional times. It's got high ambition. Uh, it's got high branding value. Uh, it, it, uh, it occupies a crucial position. In, in, in now, it's not exclusive in this area. The other day, I let me brag for a second. When I was state librarian, I got an $89 million grant for San Francisco State to build a new library, the Sutro Library there. I didn't get it personally. It was gotten for me by St. John Burton. So I, said, I, you know, I call him St. John because St. John Burton, I went before the icon, lit a candle, and all of a sudden I had $89 million. And so we went out to dedicate, out for the, for the, uh, out for the uh, San Francisco State, the new J. Paul Leonard Library, and et, et cetera. That was literally something that came out of the state library. It, it, it's now just been dedicated. And you talk about San Francisco State in 68, 69, the place was a battle zone. It was an absolute catastrophe. The, the university out there physically, psychologically, et cetera, the, the, the ambition there is just really remarkable. It, we never had to go through anything like that here. Incidentally, where I teach now at USC did not have to go through that. I don't think a lot of the USC students knew the 60s were happening. 
but it didn't register. So, seriously, the culture was just a little it's different. Orange County culture is different or, orientation. Uh, but USF went through all these periods. That no, no major damage was done, and uh, it's made, it has tremendous momentum now, tremendous ambition. I have to go see, I'd have to see now, I was senior tutor at Elliott House at Harvard for four years. My wife and I were. I have to see how the quality of undergraduate life to serve, how that's being served, but I suspect it's being done very well by, by the appropriate people in terms of food service, counseling, all that kind of thing, the, the, the dealing with undergraduates, et cetera. I would hope that that has, culture has kept pace with the, with the rise of the other things you see here. Certainly the students look just absolutely charming in the library, don't they, Sheila? They're so smart and intelligent and good-humored. And now, you have one more point. I mentioned this at dinner. When I was at USF, there were 1,200 of us, mostly young men. And a, a recent study shows that young men's brains don't come together until about 25, the two sides. So when I look back on it, I was there with about 1,200 guys whose brains had not fused yet, <laughs> to include my own. So the, 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 the co-education has made the place a little smarter, a little more civilized. <laughs> thank, thank you.